lecture here we're going to go over is chapter two of the American Yop textbook, Colliding Cultures. Um, we will go and talk about how Europeans interacting with the Native Americans, kind of when they first got into the New World, um, how those two cultures in the collision of them sort of created a bunch of problems and whatnot for, um, for both the settlers and the Native Americans and probably disproportionately for the Native Americans. So that's kind of what we're going over today. Um, overview, the Columbian Exchange transformed both sides of the Atlantic, um, but it had drastically different outcomes. We had Aztec and Incan wealth benefited Spain early. So Spain kind of was first to the party and they were able to get a whole bunch of wealth from the Aztecs and the Incan Empire and um, essentially turn that into military power back home and abroad. And then Portugal, Netherlands, and New England all raced to the New World, and Spain's dominance waned. So we can start with Ponce de Leon. He took many expeditions um, into modern day United States. He explored La Florida, which is pretty much Florida now. Um, and he hoped to find great wealth, but that never really happened. There he found between 150,000 and 300,000 Native Americans. And essentially, it was bad news from the for the Native Americans from the first time they encountered um, Spanish or even any European peoples. Are we going to put the slideshow up on the, the big board? Or the... I put it on your classroom. So we will go next, get out of that mode. Um, let's talk about the Spanish settlement efforts in the U.S. So the Spanish, when they came, encountered the Appalachian, which were one of the most powerful tribes in Florida at the time of contact. Um, and they had claimed the territory in modern Florida, Georgia, border to the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so these Native Americans were sort of living and claiming this area as their, as their area. Appalachian farmers grew an abundance of corn and other crops. Native American traders carried surplus products um, to the east along the Camino Royal, which is the royal road that the Spaniards had set up. And this royal road connected the, I guess, connected the area to St. Augustine. Now, if we're going to talk about St. Augustine, maybe we should talk about the Huguenots to begin with. Um, the Huguenots were French, French uh, Protestants, I believe. I thought I had that somewhere. Oh yeah, French Protestants says it in the note. Says it in the notes. Who left France for religious freedom, and the Spanish removed the Huguenots from modern-day Jacksonville, and so these Huguenots had left France to kind of practice their religious freedom. Um, and then they moved to what is now Jacksonville. And then when the Spanish came in to La Florida, they kind of kicked them out. Now the Spanish held Florida, but it wasn't a stronghold, let's put it that way. Some of the other European powers kind of interfered with that, specifically Sir Francis, Sir Francis Drake, um, an English privateer. He burned the settlement of St. Augustine. And then here in the New World, the Spanish attempted to use the encomienda system that worked fairly well for them in like Central America, but it did not work that great in the Americas, and so, or in North America. And so 
the Spanish kind of switched to um, more of a missions-based system, which they always had religious um, missions as part of their, their plan when they were settling, but it really came to rely on the mission system as opposed to giving people grants of land, forcing Native Americans to work for them. I think the idea was to Christianize Native Americans. Now, Spain in the Southwest sort of, it wouldn't be the first thing that the Spanish did that caused them a lot of problems, but it's something that really propelled them as a negative player in the world at this time, if they weren't already viewed that by some people. Um, we have Juan de Oñate, or Oñate. He, let's see. As the Spanish were settling west, very few of them, very few Spaniards were willing to relocate to the American Southwest um, because of the distance from Mexico City and it had a dry and hostile environment. And so the Spanish never really had like an overwhelming presence in the area, even though they did explore a lot of it. By 1680, only about 3,000 colonists called Spanish New Mexico home. And in this area, they traded with and exploited the local Puebloan peoples. And the region's population, kind of due to interactions with the Spanish, had dropped drastically, as many as 60,000 in 1600 to about 17,000 in 1680. So a massive drop in the number of people. And so like we said, missions became the engine of colonization for, for North, in North America for the Spanish. The missionaries, and most of whom were from the Franciscan religious order, provided Spain with an advanced guard in North America. And again, like I said previously, Catholicism had always justified the Spanish conquest, um, and colonization always carried religious imperatives. But here it seems like they rely on it even more. And in the early 17th century, which is the 1600s, Spanish friars had established dozens of missions along the Rio Grande and in California. So basically reaching from, um, from Gulf of Mexico to California or the Pacific Ocean. Out here in the, the American Southwest, the Spanish had sacked the Pueblo city of Acoma, also known as the Sky City. And it was a very, very, I don't know, brutal massacre, sacking of these people. And um, the next slide, I believe, yeah, this next slide, and it's a little out of order. I want to talk about the Black Legend eventually, but it kind of leads to the Spanish atrocities, leads to this idea of the Black Legend. Now, at this time, Spain's rivals emerged, their rivals mainly being England and France. And during this time period, the Reformation threw much of Europe into turmoil. So like the 14 and 1500s, much of Europe got dumped into turmoil. And it was mainly religious upheaval. And so England and France may have contested Spain earlier, but as their religious issues grew in their nation, or in their country, it impeded their earlier involvement. Basically, they needed to take care of stuff at home before they could really even venture abroad. And now, the Black Legends, what do I want to get at? Because the Black Legend um, may or may not have been an entire legend, but it definitely helped open the door and provide justification by other European powers to venture into the New World and begin colonization. So the Black Legend uh, starts, I don't know if you want to say it starts with this guy named Bartolome de, la, de las Casas, but he told of Spanish atrocities in the New World. It's titled, I think the, the title of his work that kind of led to the Black Legend was Popery Truly Displayed in Its Bloody Colors, or A Faithful Narrative of the Horde and Unexampled Massacres, Butcheries, and All Manners of Cruelties that Hell and Malice Could Invent, Committed by the Popish Spanish. So essentially, what you get out of this title is that the Spanish are doing a bunch of stuff, and it's the Catholic Spanish that are doing it. 
So it automatically puts the Spanish and Catholicism at a bad viewpoint in the world. An English writer explained that Native Americans were simple and plain men and lived without great labor. But in their lust for gold, the Spaniards forced the people that were not used to labor to stand all the day in the hot sun gathering gold in the sand of the rivers. By this means, a great number of them, not used to such pains, died. And a great number of them, seeing themselves brought from so quiet a life to such misery and slavery of desperation, killed themselves. And many would not marry because they would not have their children slaves to the Spaniards. And basically this Catholic-driven conquest of the Americas says it basically puts England, and they, they see this opportunity being ruined by the Spaniards by, by doing something in God's name, and then as they're doing this thing in God's name, they're also ruining the perception of God to the native people. And the English feel like they're, that Spain is just completely ruining this chance to Christianize people. And so they use it as a justification to go and venture into the new world. And so these stories defeated Spain's influence abroad and gave other European powers humanitarian justification for entering the new world. Humanitarian meaning that these other powers were going to go in and essentially save the native peoples from the Spaniards. So let's start with the French. Um, the French were a lot different. They, they seem to take the early involvement with Native Americans to heart. Their original plan was to find a Northwest Passage, the Northwest Passage being an all-water route through North America into Asia. That is an important one to know because on my quiz that shows up. In their effort to find the Northwest Passage, French, French explorers explored the St. Lawrence River and into the Great Lakes. So basically all around Michigan and then all along the north, now northern boundary, northeastern boundary of the United States between Canada and the United States. There were private trading companies that propelled French colonization. And fur trading was their means to, I guess, expand, or at least fur trading set the pattern for French colonization. So outposts or, or settlements or areas set up based on their value to the French fur trading patterns. And the French were a little different here. They, they focused on working alongside or working with Native Americans. They placed a higher value on cooperating with an indigenous people um, than on establishing a successful French colonial import. And they realized that if they essentially asserted their dominance to the Native American people, it could compromise their access to skilled Native American um, labor, skilled Native American uh, knowledge about where the best fur trapping locations are, the best routes, and, and cut them off to the Native Americans who themselves kind of already had their own trade network set up amongst themselves. Very few of the Frenchmen traveled to the New World to settle permanently. In fact, very few traveled at all. So a lot of these people were coming over with an attempt to either make wealth so that they could go back home and, and um, buy an estate or buy some sort of land for their family to live on, or they would go there and work for a period of time and then come back to Europe. French and native relations. Well, obviously they're not establishing a trading relationship with students. It would be native Americans. Fix that right quick. Um, so they established a trading relationship with native Americans, like I said, and they fostered a more cooperative and mutually beneficial relationship with native Americans than was typical with the Spanish and the English. The French were still Catholic, and they wanted to possibly 
debunk the anti-Catholic elements of the black legend. They wanted to maybe temper the black legend and remove the, the part about how it's a Catholic thing causing the issues. And the French work to cultivate cooperation with Native Americans. They had these people, um, Jesuit missionaries, for instance. They adopted different conversion strategies than the Spanish uh, Franciscan monks did. <clears throat> Where, so like the Spanish missionary style brought natives into enclosed missions, and the Jesuits often lived among the Native Americans. And often French fur traders married Native American women. In fact, the offspring of Native American women and French men were so common in New France that the French developed a word for these children, Métis, or sage. If I can say it in my French accent, Métis. Métis, I don't know. I don't speak French, so. I'm sorry. Ha -ha. The Huron people developed a particularly close relationship with the French. And many of them converted to Christianity and engaged in the fur trade. Now, this all sounds great, but their close relationship with the French came at a high cost later on. And specifically, when the French and the Dutch kind of had conflicts going on, the natives were sort of forced to choose a side because they were supposed to be working with these people. And in the end, they lose out. And then when the English come in, eventually they're already weakened. And, and so it just kind of doesn't help them out, even though maybe the heart was in the right place. We have this area called a middle ground. Um, and historians say that the, the powerful Iroquois pushed many Algonquin speaking peoples towards French territory in the mid 17th century. And then together they created this thing called a middle ground, which was like a cross-cultural space that allowed for native and European interaction, negotiation, and accommodation. French traders adopted, sometimes clumsily, the gift-giving and mediation strategies expected of native leaders. And then native leaders uh, similarly engaged in impersonal European market and adapted to European laws. In this middle ground area, the Great Lakes middle ground, experienced tumultuous success throughout the late 17th and early 18th centuries until the English colonial efforts and American settlers swarmed the region. So again, it worked really well until the English kind of stepped in. The pressures of European expansion strained even the closest bonds. So yes, they did work well together, but the European expansion pressures kind of caused some, caused some issues between these two groups that were bound pretty well together. Now the Dutch, and in this slide I have the VOC, which is the Dutch, the Dutch East India Company, um, but the Dutch in the New World had the Dutch West, Indy Co West Indies Company. And so the Dutch sought profit and not conquest. The Dutch worked with the Native Americans, and they also kind of approached it differently. And some of the, the Dutch people, um, specifically I believe it was Peter Minuit, bought Manhattan from the Muncie people. So they tried to buy land from the natives. Um, this is a little wrong. Perhaps they didn't even buy it from the right people, and it's because the, the Native Americans didn't have the same sort of property ownership values that Europeans had. As a matter of fact, it was basically property kind of was use. If you were using it, then I guess you possessed it, um, according to the natives. And it could be hunting land, it could be farming land, um, but the Dutch bought it from them. Now with the trade idea, the Dutch bought, or bought, the Dutch traders carried wampum, which were these like uh, shell beads fashioned by Alg Algonquins in southern New England coast. And this was a valued ceremonial and diplomatic commodity among the Iroquois. And so the Dutch knew this was a valuable product or a valuable item, and so they carried it with them to trade. The West India Company directors implemented a patroon system 
to encourage colonization. And what the patroon system did is it granted large estates to wealthy landlords who subsequently paid passage for the tenants to work their land. But labor shortages crippled Dutch colonization. And this is true for many European nations. The risk was too great, the life was too hard to travel to the New World, even though there were many other re reasons at home to leave. Um, but the patroon system failed to bring enough tenants, and the colony could not attract a sufficient number of indentured servants to satisfy the colony's backers. To deal with this labor shortage, and this is a very important step in American history, maybe a changing point in American history, the, colony, the Dutch colony imported 11 enslaved people that were owned by the, the West India Company, Dutch West India Company, in 1626. This was the same year that they purchased Manhattan, that Minuit purchased in Manhattan. These laborers were tasked with building New Amsterdam, which is modern-day New York City. It's like the very, very tip of Manhattan. This included a defensive wall on the northern edge of the colony, which, if you guys know anything about New York City, there used to be a wall there, and now it's called Wall Street, and so that's kind of about where this wall was, on Wall Street. Um, these slaves created the, the roads and maintained the port. The Dutch, though, were afraid, maybe unlike the French mixing with Native Americans or whatever, but the Dutch were afraid that the Dutch people living there would mix and intermarry with the African slaves. And so the Dutch imported African women so that African marriage could occur. And what this produced was families that had kids. And so the slave population in this area increased to around 500 enslaved Africans by 1660. So essentially, uh, let's say 1641 to 1660, they went from 11 to 500. So it was roughly 20 years. And at this time, New England had the largest enslaved population on the continent. Now, the textbook talks about Portugal. We've already talked about Portugal and the Cartas system and setting up factories. And for the most part, the Portuguese do a lot of stuff um, out in the east towards, towards Asia. Uh, but we're going to skip them right now. We're going to go straight to England and Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen. She oversaw England's golden age, and this included the expansion of trade and exploration, and it had liter literary achievements of Shakespeare and Marlowe, so a golden age for England. England's economic system focused mainly on mercantilism, and it's a state-assisted manufacturing and trading system. Created, it created and maintained markets. So basically, the government creates and maintains markets. They interfere with, um, with the trade and who can and can't have businesses within the country. The markets provided a steady supply of consumers and laborers. It stimulated economic expansion and increased English wealth. Now, after the Black Death, the population of Europe in general had bottomed out. But around 1500, the English population was fewer than 3 million. But by the middle of the 17th century, so like 1650, the popula population had skyrocketed to over 5 million. This skyrocketing drove land cost up. Um, it was too expensive because too many people needed and wanted land. Many people could not afford it. And it just kind of crowded the continent. This skyrocketing of land costs, though, also led to a drop in income because not enough people could find jobs. Many unemployment people. Rents and prices rose, but the wages that people were paid stagnated. Again, think of the worker as a commodity. And if there's too many workers, then they don't have to pay the worker that much because someone else will do it for cheaper. You can, it's easy to find workers. And even crazier is there were movements to enclose public land and this sparked a transition of English landholders from agricultural agriculture to livestock raising. And they removed tenants from the land 
and created hordes of landless, jobless peasants that haunted the cities in the countryside. One quarter to one half of the population lived in extreme poverty. Moving right along, we're almost done. Try to keep it short. Justifications for colonization. We can say four main ones here. Um, there's probably a few other ones and a few other factors that contributed to it. The supporters of the English colonization always touted more than economic gains and mere national self-interest. They claimed to be doing God's work. Many claimed that colonization would glorify England and Protestantism by Christianizing the New World's pagan peoples. Common theme here in Europe is they're going to come here and save the Native Americans from their godless um, life. England repeated the black legend of Spanish New World terrorism, right? And attacked the sins of the Catholic Spain. This would be a blow against Spanish heresy and bring Protestant religion to the New World. Basically, what they're saying is we are not Spain. We want to be better than Spain. We don't want to do anything like Spain used to do because it was so wrong and so bad. They even took it a step further and said they were going to save the New World from Catholic rule. Now, there are also obvious economic advantages. Trade and resource extraction would enrich the English treasury. England, for instance, could find plentiful materials to outfit a world-class navy. Moreover, he said the New World could provide an escape for England's vast armies of landless vagabonds. And so these things we talked about in the previous slide, this is kind of a solution to them, the New World, colonizing. He said expanded trade would not only bring profit, but also improve, provide work for England's jobless poor. And so what you have here is the colonies, the new world, being a social safety valve. Solve the unemployment problem. They could increase economic activity in the country. They could save the new world from Catholicism. And they could help build a navy so that they can fight Spain. Now, through collaboration with the government, monopolies and employing financial innovations such as joint stock companies, England's merchants sought to improve on the Dutch economic system. So they had a mixture of the government and private investment where they both worked together. So the investors might chip in their money jointly, but the, colon the crown or the, the government kind of backs them up and only allows a certain number of businesses that trade in certain items, or like you could think of tea, um, the government only gives one, one joint stock company the right to sell tea in the whole country. And if you didn't have that right to sell tea, then you would be shut down or everything you had would be seized by the, by the crown. And so they basically made it so that there were state-sponsored monopolies, meaning the government guaranteed that certain businesses controlled a specific corner of the market. Now, these joint stock companies, sort of like modern-day uh, corporations, became the initial instruments of colonization. With gov government monopolies, shared profits, and managed risks, these money-making ventures could attract and manage the vast capital needed for colonization. Now, early English ventures into the New World were interesting. Um, England sponsored these sea dogs or basically piracy, um, known as privateering, a fancier word uh, to basically give people the green light to go out and raid ships. Queen Elizabeth sponsored these sailors, such as John Hawkins or Sir Francis Drake, which we mentioned earlier, I believe, to plunder Spanish ships and towns in the Americas. Essentially, she said, hey, you're free to go and steal, rob, whatever you need to. Um, Give us a little bit of what you got, and you can keep a lot of it. And so it was kind of like this 
this, pri this way to give people a chance to make their own money, but they assumed the risk, and the crown just collected what they had, all the while giving the Spanish a blow. They transformed crime into politics. They basically made a crime, something that was illegal, piracy on the seas, they made it into politics. They used it to their advantage to weaken the Spanish. Francis Drake, who eventually became a knight, Sir Francis Drake, um, harassed Spanish ships throughout the Western Hemisphere and raided Spanish caravans as far as the coast of Peru on the Pacific Ocean. Now this privateering, Spain was ticked. They knew that the crown was backing it and they assumed it was a, a, an assault on them just like a naval assault or a military assault. When tensions worsened, when uh, Queen Mary, Queen of Scots, a Catholic, was executed. And in 1588, King Philip II of Spain released the largest invasion in history and wanted to destroy the British Navy and depose Elizabeth. This is the Spanish Armada. Make sure I don't have anything else on the back. All right, no. So the Spanish Armada, um, thousand ships, thousand plus ships, thousands of ships sail to take over and defeat the British. The Spanish ships were slow and cumbersome. The English had fast moving ships and they were very agile. And so this kind of caught the Spanish off guard and the, and the English were able to outmaneuver the Spanish ships and kind of on the first day of the battle had won a little bit of a victory or after the first round of fighting. And the Spanish withdrew and an environmental factor that may be unforeseen to anyone a big storm whips up through the English Channel and wipes out the Spanish Armada. And this became known as the Divine Wind. And so maneuverability on part of the English ships and then intervention on part of the environment um, kind of changed the course of history. Now let's look to English settlement in the New World. Jamestown. There was this uninhabited peninsula they selected. It was, uh, it was kind of out of land of Spanish patrols. It offered easy defense against ground assaults and was both uninhabited and located close to many Native American villages with potentially lucrative trade networks. Unfortunately, it had a lot of brackish water and disease. And if my knowledge of water suits me well, brackish water I think is a mixture of salt water and um, I guess fresh water. And so it's not really useful for drinking or, you know, irrigating crops if they would have needed irrigation. The indigenous people had been smart enough not to settle there. Terrible soil, hampered agriculture, and brackish tidal water led to debilitating diseases. Jamestown was a profit-seeking venture backed by investors, and the colonists were mostly gentlemen and they proved entirely unprepared for the challenges ahead. They had hoped for easy riches. They didn't find any. John Smith later said these people would rather starve than work. And they did. Disease and starvation ravaged the colonists. Thanks in part to the unhealthy location and the fact that supplies from England arrived sporadically. Fewer than half the original colonists survived the first nine months. These were a bunch of guys that John Smith says weren't used to working, nor did they want to work. They were just relying on shipments from England. And back in, you know, 1600s, those were not super reliable. Now, the Powhatan, and I believe the Powhatan chief, his name was Powhatan. Uh, I don't know a whole bunch about Native American specifically in this, but he has this thing, the Powhatan Confederacy, a group of people um, that kind of work with him or for him or, or unified under him. And they traded with the English and placed a high value on metal axe heads, kettles, tools, and guns. And they traded furs and other abundant goods for them. 10,000 Confederate natives and with food in abundance, indigenous people had little to fear and much to gain from the isolated outpost of sick and dying Englishmen. So they didn't really care that they were there because they weren't strong enough. The, the Jamestown settlers were not strong enough to do anything to hurt them. Winter hits and it's not good. 
The settlers ate everything they could. They roamed the woods for nuts and berries. Now again, these people had not been fighting or had not been preparing for winter. They were hoping for easy wishes. Again, John Smith said they did not really work. They would rather starve than work. These people ended up boiling leather. They dug up graves to eat the corpses. One man was executed for killing and eating his wife. In 2012, actually, there was an uh, excavation of a 14-year-old a girl that had shown signs of cannibalism. And by the summer of 1610, all but 60 of those settlers had died. But Superman didn't come to save Jamestown. Instead, it was tobacco. Tobacco, tobacco. In 1616, John Rolfe in the first grew the first tobacco crop in Virginia. Um, tobacco is a very labor-intensive uh, crop to grow. And so they needed many people to work to grow the crop. Thus, they in implemented a head right policy. And so basically, if you uh, agreed to come to the New World, you could get a certain amount of land and you would be able to settle. Uh, it says, any person who migrated to Virginia would automatically receive 50 acres of land and any immigrant whose passage they paid would entitle them to 50 acres more. What's odd about that system is you're kind of setting up the rich to own a lot of land. And if you think about it, um, if you could pay for your own passage to the New World, you're going to automatically receive 50 acres. For every person you pay, you get 50 more acres. And before you know it, one guy could pay for the passage of, I don't know, 100 people, and he's got all that acreage, 5,000 acres to go along. And the idea was to bring people over, labor over, to work the land. So a person came over, they got their land, they could grow tobacco, and then that would be a cash cow for England. Because it is so lucrative and because it's so labor intensive, slavery comes about. A Dutch slave ship sold 20 Africans to the Virginia colonists, and this southern slavery was born. Now, as tobacco grew in popularity, they needed more land. They, the settlers needed more land to grow more crops. And the colonists expanded into the Palatine's land. Now, Palatine dies and his brother takes over. Um, o Okeechobee, uh, it's not Okeechobee, it's a city in Florida, I think, but it's something like that, his brother. And he attacks the colonists in Virginia. Maybe he was justified in standing up for his land, but all this did for his people is kind of open the door. It gave the English justification to attack them because they were a threat to the Native Americans. And so the colonists come in droves, fight them off, and push them away, and it kind of opens the land for them to take at their will. Let's talk about New England, shift gears, because New England is a little different. Migrants to New England expected economic profit. Religious motives directed the rhetoric and much of the reality of these colonies. Not every English person who moved to New England during the 17th century was Puritan, but the Puritans were by far the most dominant in politics, religion, and culture of New England. And there's this idea that the Puritans are, I guess, killjoys, buzzkills. I don't know what, you want, what word you want to say. Sort of a little exaggerated. Um, they wanted a middle path between a corrupt world and and, and again, they may not say that they were super, super crazy religious. Um, they were definitely, in their minds, not sinners and whatnot. But they wanted a middle ground path. Um, and you might think in your head, well, the, the one thing they wouldn't do is drink. Well, they did. They, they, they were not afraid to drink and, I guess, have a good time. They never left to abandon England, but they wanted to form a city on a hill or a godly community. 
and have it be an example for reformers back home. These Puritans, unlike the southern uh, colonies, arrived in family groups. And right off the bat, that kind of gave them a little more stability. Unfortunately, or I guess it wouldn't be unfortunately, the, they had less fertile soil and there were longer winters. And this prevented large-scale farming and eventually it led to no, no real need for slaves. But their economic activity changed to other things and I got some of that down here. They mostly um, had small farms, shops, fishing, lumber, shipbuilding, and then trade with the Atlantic world. That was their economic activity. There was a combination of environmental factors and the Puritan social ethos, and it produced a region of remarkable health and stability during the 17th century. Because they didn't have these long uh, summers or hot summers, stagnant uh, brackish water near them like Jamestown did. Disease, tropical diseases specifically, were not as big a problem to them. And in fact, diseases helped them, not the ones that they caught, the ones that the Puritans and the New England settlers were immune to, specifically smallpox and measles. And many of the Native Americans that they had around them died from those diseases and it opened the door for them to move in because their population, Native American populations were so diminished. In fact, it was a lethal pandemic, smallpox, during the, six, during the 1610s that swept away as much as 90% of the region's Native American population. And then many of these survivors welcomed the English as potential allies against rival tribes who had escaped the catastrophe. Now, the Puritans set out to build their utopia by creating communities of the godly groups of men, of the godly. Groups of men, often from the same region of England, applied to the colony's general court for land grants. They then took that land and divided it uh, apart for immediate use while keeping much of the rest as commons or undivided land for future generations. The town's inhabitants collectively decided the size of each settler's home lot based on their current wealth and status. Now, beside overseeing property, these towns restricted membership. New arrivals needed to apply for admission. Those who gained admittance could participate in town governments that, while not democratic by modern standards, nevertheless had broad popular involvement. Those that had received their property from this, this organization, of, from the town, I guess, could vote in town meetings and choose the selectmen, assessors, constables, and other officials among themselves to conduct the daily affairs of government. So we kind of have a little bit of a democracy coming into play here in New England. And upon their foundings, towns wrote co covenants, reflecting the Puritan belief in God's covenant with his people. Towns sought to arbitrate disputes and contain strife as did the church. Wavered or divergent individuals were persuaded, corrected, or coerced. And so think of covenants as maybe like a form of local government, um, writing it out, who was in charge of, of executing that government, um, and just essentially the church, as you could think of them as a judicial system to an extent, or the town council as a judicial, judicial system, if I can speak. And if persuasion or arbitration failed, people who did not conform to community norms were punished or removed. Massachusetts, for instance, banned, banished Anne Hutchinson, Roger Williams, and other religious dissenters like the Quakers. So even if you didn't fit in with their religious view, you would be kicked out of their towns as well. And that's all I got for this week too. Um, once you feel like you got it down, I'll give you the chance to take the quiz. It'll be on our, our uh, classroom. And if this is something somebody else randomly is watching, well, you can take the quiz if you want, if you can find it. That's it.